up. Oh my God, I'm being recorded. I have to be careful what I say. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody. Uh, and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I always enjoyed this meeting, um, even if it's virtual. Um, the uh, presentation I'm gonna give you today is, is a bit more uh, a combination of sort of a, a tour of, of the concepts around connectivity that we've talked about today in various forms. Um, and then a bit more uh, of sort of some grounding, as I said, in the abstract to help you, uh, those of you who will be attending the meeting over the coming days, uh, get a better idea of, of the, when they talk about concepts, what they may actually mean. And hopefully it'll help sort of guide um, your thoughts and discussions um, as uh, as things move forward, I'm going to just change my pointer to a laser pointer for some slides. Um, this slide is actually uh, all the logos from the uh, all 20 of the brain connectivity workshops um, that we've had, and it does show you um, first of all that the, we've we've covered a lot of ground geographically. Um, I think the one uh, the one that Sydney came to is actually the one in Havana. Um, I will mention, and I'm not sure if Ed's still around, but I think one of the most memorable uh, discussions we had was actually punting on the Thames with, uh, and Ed was actually holding a pint in one hand and punting single-handedly down the Thames. So it was definitely an interesting use of coordination dynamics and uh, breaking symmetry to get from one place to another place. Um, the point of this slide is really to talk about the fact that this notion of connectivity has been evolving um, over the course of, of this meeting and over the course of science as it has evolved in the ensuing 20 years. It is kind of stunning to think about the fact that this thing in fact happened the first time in Dusseldorf in 2022 when um, Ralph Cotter and Carl were the co-organizers for the first cons uh, workshop. And now we're sort of back at the same place in 2022. And it's, it's, it's uh, nice to reflect upon what we've achieved and have not achieved in that, in that point in time. Um, generally speaking, um, the connectivity that we think about in the brain spans uh, two dimensions. One is a bit more static, and that being the anatomy. And this is a famous figure from the Feldman Van Essen um, papers. I can think about it as almost the first connectome, although it's not truly that. Um, it's basically just the summary of all the connections that had been mapped out at that point in time for the primate, uh, the monkey, I should say. Um, cortex. Um, we do try and estimate anatomy um, with diffusion tensor imaging that's been applied across a number of species and you've heard some examples today. Um, anatomy you can think about as sort of the pipes or the conduit that allow um, different parts of the brain to work together um, and interact. And, um, but the anatomy in and of itself is not really sufficient to, to help us understand um, the emergent functions that actually that happen. And that's where the, the, the dynamics come in. Each of these nodes that are part of these um, networks do have dynamics that generate activity and this activity is propagated through these conduits. And so we have conduits and we have communications and they are constantly uh, interacting with one another um, across space and across time as we've heard um, earlier today. So what I'm gonna try and cover today are, are, are three um, aspects of connectivity. Um, we've talked a lot about all three of these different uh, versions. I'm going to start with the idea of structural connectivity. And historically, um, obviously, this is the one that's been around the longest, and it is um, structural connection. It's meant to indicate that there is, in fact, an external connection between um, regions of the brain. Um, it is meant to indicate that it could be directional. So you can have connections that are um, reciprocal, or they can actually be stronger in one direction than another. And that's the important feature of structural connectivity. Um, it is inferred. Um, it is inferred from tracers. Tracers are a pretty good estimate of the connection strength between two regions, but there is some slop in, 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 in using tracers to measure the brain. Even though people will tell you that that's the gold standard, if you've ever done it, you'll realize that there's a lot of measurement error in actually using tracers. Um, tractography is the more, more recent one um, and uh, structural connectivity. It does vary, but it varies relatively slowly um, across time. The two functional measures, we have functional connectivity, and as mentioned earlier today, it's, a, it's an estimate of the statistical dependence of activity. Um, and there is variation across the uh, literature, whether the, the dependence of activity is actually across time 
which was the original uh, instance of the term, or across examples. Examples could be trials, it could be individuals. Um, so for example, when you look at structural covariance, for example, that Ed talked about earlier, that's usually an estimate of the statistical dependency across instances, and particularly subjects usually. It's non-directional. Um, you use measures of association, typically correlations, to, um, to estimate functional connection. And functional connectivity, of course, varies across many scales. You've got very high sort of micro or sub-microsecond functional connection between neurons, but also the very long time scales that we can measure with um, fMRI and EEG. Effective connectivity um, uh, indicates that there's some sort of causal dependence between those. Um, it is directional, so you can estimate the effects that uh, one region has on another. There are a number of measures to est estimate these things, and I'll go on through some of them uh, uh, a bit later on. And as just like functional connectivity, um, obviously effective connectivity will also vary um, across different, different scales. So let's start with structural connectivity first. Um, last year, um, my good friend and colleague, Julia Tonono made, made the uh, a statement that anatomy is destiny. And I thought that was a rather sort of profound statement. And I wanted to just ref uh, put that back into your, your, to your minds in terms of what that may actually mean, or if it has no meaning at all, it's okay, but at least it's, it, sounds, it sounds pretty good on paper. So um, there is a, a long history of, of trying to use the anatomy uh, and the various ways of representing it to get some sort of higher order properties um, of these um, connections. So getting back to the diagrams, this is a variation of the film in Venice, and this is actually the visual um, cortical system in the, in the primate. Um, I think one of the first examples, at least the most, one of the most popular examples that came out of the, the use of these matrices actually was published by Malcolm Young. Um, it led to a whole sort of flood of papers around the same time. I know Klaus is part of that uh, group as well as um, Jack Scannell, I think who's gone now, um, if I'm not mistaken, fortunately. Um, but uh, Malcolm, um, he used the adjacency matrix where he recoded the matrix that you see over here as a series of, I think, zero ones and twos, and then applied what's called the non-metric multidimensional scaling um, uh, method to these uh, data and, and showed them in uh, sort of a, a large space. And this is actually, this, this case it's two dimensional, but you can actually extrude that to three or four dimensional. And what he showed quite nicely is that um, these, this connection matrix, JC matrix, when you put it into this multi-dimensional space based roughly on the distances, you do see clustering of regions that kind of correspond to the dorsal and ventral streams um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the visual cortex. And it was a nice confirmation that there is some um, you know, functional relevance for the anatomy and that you can re represent this anatomy in a different way. Um, I think one of the people who pushed this a lot, of course, Ralph was one of the founders of, of this uh, workshop. Um, in that very first workshop, um, he uh, presented the notion of participation um, uh, indices, which is a variation of some graph metrics, which we've talked about uh, earlier today. Um, this is Ralph in uh, Im Schiffchen in uh, Dusseldorf, uh, when I was visiting him many years ago and having this is some chocolates you have for dessert here. Yummy, yummy. Um, anyway, you can represent um, some dependencies in this particular case. I think this is actually the somatomotor cortex um, in terms of the connection matrix per se, and then extract different properties. For example, symmetry of connections, where there's more or less transmission between different areas, and then characterizing um, what the uh, distribution might look like and whether there's something specific about a certain region of the brain. Um, and that, of course, led to the explosion that we had heard about earlier today about the application of graph theory uh, to the brain. Graph theory has been around a long time. I'm not going to go through the details. I think um, it was covered quite nicely by Alex um, earlier today, um, as well as Ed in some context as well. But you do, uh, get, you do have to understand that graph theory is, is not specific to the brain. It's been applied to a number of different fields. Um, and it's been quite helpful in being able to, to, to utilize the language of graphs and applying that to things like the brain. So it gives us a new language to be able to communicate what we're seeing um, in, in, in the nervous system. Um, you saw this, uh, this diagram earlier. 
Um, and this is just getting at the notion that they're by characterizing brain networks in terms of things like graphs, we can extract properties that tell us what specifically is unique about um, the configuration of the nervous system. For example, the Watson Strogatz um, paper um, identified this, this idea of small world networks, which is a uh, characterization of certainly the nervous system, but also other networks that process information as well. Um, graphs, of course, is, uh, just quickly um, are in fact um, uh, depicted as a series of, of nodes um, and edges. And they can be directed, undirected, weighted, or binary. Some of the earlier applications were uh, undirected and um, binary, but there's been various uh, evolutions from that as well. Um, one of the, the tricks in those earlier applications was how you, in fact, threshold these matrices. Um, because if you go in there, for example, if you're using diffusion tensor imaging as your initial input for these matrices, often DTI data will come with you as a sort of a fully connected matrix, which is actually not realistic. So you have to find some way of thresholding it to eliminate sort of the spurious connections and focus on those that you think are in fact the ground truth. Um, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but there are of course extensions of the graph metrics to functional connections, which I'll talk about in a second. And there too, the thresholding becomes quite important. Uh, to know how do you eliminate and why would you eliminate connections that are close to zero but not necessarily zero. And that's a, a controversial area that we can uh, talk about when we're punting on the Thames with the pint in the, uh, or something like that. Um, the applications of these graph uh, metrics to the brain, there's uh, several. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through them all. This is some of the earlier ones with people who are um, you know, part of this group, Olaf Sporns, Chris Honey, uh, and, and Ralph. Um, and again, um, this, this notion is to, to, to then help identify certain regions or collections of regions that have specific features that differentiates them um, from other brain um, networks or brain regions. Um, here we're talking about characterizations of certain parts of the uh, cortex in terms of participation coefficients, how many networks do different brain regions get involved with. Um, this idea that we could use the connectome uh, to, to get a better understanding was uh, further uh, elaborated and, and, um, by, uh, again, Olaf, um, Julio, and Rolf um, by a very seminal paper um, that was published around 2005 that talked about the idea, at least, of building a human connectome. And this preceded the Human Brain Project by um, several years. Um, but I did propose that for, to really get an understanding of the, of, of, of the human brain, we should move beyond sort of describing in individual areas and try and get some ideas of the structural components of that and then merge that with function, which is exactly you know, why we're here today for the particular uh, exercise that we're going through now, but also the exercise we're going through in the next couple of days. So this was sort of a, a seminal paper. And um, at that time, um, Patrick Hagman in his dissertation also proposed the same term, human connectome. So both Patrick and, um, and Olaf and his colleagues are um, credited with the first use of the term connectome, at least in published works. Um, and in fact, this, these, these people ended up working together and taking some diffusion tensor imaging data from um, the, the data that Patrick had collected um, in five subjects, but it was quite, quite high number of um, uh, high resolution at least. And looking at character, characteristics of, of, the, um, of the connectome uh, measured with structure. And this is one of the representations from the paper. Um, you do see that there are, are collections of regions that seem to be providing some idea of, of regions or zones or hubs. Um, and some of these hubs um, tend to be in regions that we all know now, or so sort of medial, medial parietal cortices, sort of the cuneus tends to be one of the key areas. Um, in the brain from a structural perspective. And this comes out in these data, it's been replicated a number of times, um, not just in humans, but also in, um, in uh, monkeys as well. One of the things that was um, uh, noted um, in these early days um, was the uh, relationship and variation in the relationship between structure and function. Um, in the old days, um, the old days of anatomy, I think it was believed that if we really got mapped the entire anatomical structure of the brain, we would understand that. And that's probably overstating it, but that was sort of an aspiration. So then one would assume then that if we had the structural connections mapped out, we would be able to map them directly on the functional connections. Um, and that's not true. 
um, there's a number of papers that show that there's a, there is a, a non-zero correlation between structure and function, but it's not perfect. And perhaps that's not surprising because functional connections, as you'll see in a minute, can go a number of different routes. So the structure provides the conduit, if you will, again, for interactions to take place, but the dynamics themselves are what um, evolve the functional networks. And the functional networks may not involve all the nodes. It may involve separate pathways. And that's an important feature of differentiating um, functional and structural um, connections in a general sense. Um, I'll take a quick pause here just to go through um, some of the issues around um, the estimation of structural connections with diffusion tensor imaging. Um, this again is a, uh, a very long um, set of arguments. There was a, a, some, some intense discussion about this at several of the brain connectivity workshops. I'm not gonna go through these in any detail, but it is one of these things you need to be mindful of if you're trying to estimate structural connectivity and assuming that it's, it's gold standard in terms of diffusion tensor estimation per se. Um, these methods do vary uh, across groups at the basic level of just how data are acquired but also in terms of how tracks are estimated with this deterministic versus probabilistic, um, how many, um, what the criteria are for, for bending of connections to that sort, how large your parcellation scheme is. Um, and keeping in mind that you're, you're looking at diffusion of water. So you're estimating fairly large fiber bundles, but you don't really measure the endpoints of those connections. So it's really is you're inferring connections. You're not really measuring to the same degree you might with tracer. Um, one of the things that comes up a number of times is that when you're, you're looking at different groups um, and measuring tracks per se and, and looking at the tracks themselves, you just need to be mindful of the potential artifacts that do vary across groups. They do vary as a function of um, uh, maturation and aging. They do vary in, in the face of things like degeneration. Um, and those can affect the, 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 the core image acquisition themselves which will then cascade and affect your ability to estimate the tracks too. Um, most people know that, I hope, but it's also something that has you have to be mindful of when you're doing this kind of work because it, it can come back to haunt you, believe me. Um, I should have mentioned I had this a slide at the beginning and the bottom I have a, a GitHub link that has the link to the slides. So um, if you wanna get these papers, I'm not gonna store them, you can get the slides a bit later on. Let's talk about functional um, connectivity. Um, so why would you wanna go ahead and do this functional effective connectivity measure? Um, uh, the first reason is that, you know, we can measure networks with, with structural connectivity for sure, but functional networks really require you to go the extra step and look at how regions are at least varying together in some way, shape or form. Um, there are, of course, uh, you can, you want to infer when you look at an activation map, for example, that these areas that are activated by a particular task are a network. That's not necessarily written in stone. You do need to look at some higher order metrics between these regions, like covariation, um, to get an idea that they're actually in some ways um, functionally connected at least. Um, and the anatomy itself doesn't, does guarantee that if you have activity changes that this will cascade um, to other regions. And in fact, there are some, some older um, works that were done looking at behavioral changes um, and measuring functional connections and neurons um, and finding that in fact, you, you, can, you might see changes in the, in the functional connections before you see, see activity change. So it's quite important because that tells you that it may precede um, some more permanent changes in the, in the actions of these brains. So the term, <laughs> has been around a while, functional connectivity. Uh, I can't really take a poll in person, but I can, does anybody know when the, the term was first throw, thrown out there? Uh, last year, yesterday, this morning, for sure. <laughs> um, the first example I found was actually in some old work from Wilder Penfield. Um, who you might know was uh, sort of a, was a epileptologist neurologist from Montreal, um, very famous in terms of being able to map the brain, um, but also looking at epilepsy and uh, doing some very interesting uh, uh, observations of patients. And he mentioned this term functionally connected in the, in the course of what happens to things like memory when you um, remove certain parts of the brain. And finding that in fact, memory per se was not as 
uh, strongly affected. Remember, this is before HM uh, was discovered, uh, the patient. Um, suggesting that it doesn't abolish the memory, it may affect it. And this suggests that this region uh, may be functionally connected with the neural record, which suggested that the memory itself was a more distributed function. This was actually mentioned in his 1958 um, papers. So I, I have found this and in fact, in fact, he does say that in this particular example. If you have an opportunity to get this particular paper, um, this is an excellent, excellent paper to give you an idea of some of the history of what actually happens in the, in the surgery room when they're measuring all these patients and looking at the phenomenology of things like brain stimulation when people were um, getting the surgery done. It's not quite as clear as people may have thought it was in terms of what actually happens here. So it's a nice sort of historical uh, perspective. I would say the first um, uh, published example of this in, in human the brain is this work from Barry Horowitz, who was like, again, one of the founding members of this uh, consortium. Um, and Barry was looking at um, correlations across individuals of um, uh, meta metabolic measures using PET um, and finding some, some interesting uh, correlations across different parts of the brain. It's interesting that the, the idea of resting state was, was introduced here. These people were actually just sitting in the PET scanner um, and having, uh, I think it was eyes closed. But anyway, um, this was sort of the first example of, of functional connections in the most general form of the term, use of the term. Um, and these, these were actually quite informative just from getting a general idea of, of how useful these metrics were, um, but also then developing them for applications elsewhere. Um, Carl and his group, for example, introduced a number of techniques, one of them called PPI or psychophysiological interactions, which is looking at the variations of functional connections as a function of task. Um, and it showed that sometimes you can just do that and get a pretty good idea of what's, what's happening. Um, for example, this was an early uh, um, paper from the, the UCL group looking at changes in um, functional connectivity as a function of, <laughs> as a function of fear conditioning and showing that um, uh, a difference in the connections between the pulvinar and amygdala, uh, depending on whether you see an actual uh, condition stimulus or not. Uh, and a, a nice little story, very tight uh, correlation pattern. This was, was a nice example of PPI being used. Um, dimensionality reduction has been mentioned a couple of times, at least today. Uh, I think one of the ones that's been pushed a lot in terms of being able to extract functional networks as independent components analysis. Um, it is, you know, you can think about it as a, as a, as a slicker form of principal components analysis. Um, they do often give similar answers, although not necessarily identical. Um, so I will have that caveat. That's my opinion, at least. Um, but uh, the notion here is that you're trying to, to take a large data set where you've got, for example, if you put it in voxels um, and reduce it to some lower dimensional space that you can understand. And this has been used. Um, it, was, uh, it was used a, a lot in the, in the early days as a way to eliminate artifacts, um, which it does a great job of doing. Um, but it also allows you to, again, look at, instead of looking at all the voxels, you can look at a subset that are representing some sort of network and look at how those networks vary um, across individuals, for instance, um, and so on. And uh, uh, Jessica Danwasso, who was part of our group as well, um, the, the collective, um, as it were, uh, early on, um, working um, with the people at, the, at Oxford, as well as her group in uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, were amongst the first to, to identify these sort of consistent resting state networks and independent components analysis. Thank you for writing on my screen. I appreciate that. Um, you, you do see some of the sort of canonical networks that we see, you know, the default mode networks are here, uh, visual cortices are here. And these ones, you know, depending on your parcellation and dimensionality, you do get slight differences in the, in the configurations of the networks, but they do seem pretty stable uh, across um, individuals and across fMRI studies. And nicely enough, if you look at some of these patterns, at least in other techniques, like for example, um, MEG, you do find that some of these networks do represent themselves in things with faster time scales, particularly the default mode does seem to show up in, in MEG uh, data as well. Um, functional connectivity usually is measured across a long time scale, relatively speaking. So it's usually across tens of twenties of minutes, for instance. Um, so it's considered almost like a stationary measure in some respects. Um, and uh, um, a number of groups have um, 
looked at the sort of stationary component of this and, and breaking it down into the various networks. This is work from Alan et al. And so with Cortex, just finding that these, these ROIs do sort of cluster in the canonical networks quite nicely. What sort of evolved from that um, was a number of groups who observed that if you look at time windows, the sliding time windows of functional connections across um, the, the uh, epoch of scanning, you do find that the functional connectivity patterns in these networks do vary, suggesting that even though you can think about these nest networks as being uh, not really stationary, but at least there over a long period of time, their configuration does change. Um, so network affiliations can change and the nature of these transitions may in fact provide more insights into cognitive dynamics. And this is an important aspect of the evolving ideas of functional connectivity that it's not something that's static, it does change. It could change as a function of just what you're doing. It could change as a function of, of age, of different kind of disease groups and so on. And these dynamics, these patterns that are, that are, that are evolving could be a, a very important aspect. And in fact, this kind of comes back to some of the ideas that Hiba was talking about, about trajectories and so on, that these dynamics reflect in, in some respects trajectories. And the trajectories could not could in fact be, come on, and we're gonna go forward. Trajectories could be good things. The direct trajectories could be indices of um, uh, cognitive status. So for example, this is a great paper from Joanna Cabral and colleagues using what's called LIDA, which is a decomposition method, which allows you to look at dynamics of functional connectivity. And using that, you can, you can look at the probability of transitioning between different patterns of functional connectivity. And what they reported was that um, older individuals who had uh, good cognitive status show a particular pattern of preferred trajectories indicated by the green areas, whereas those that had poor cognitive status tended to have trajectories that were more indicated by the uh, black arrows, suggesting that not just the pattern per se, but actually the temporal evolution and the preferred temporal evolution um, of the trajectories was related to cognitive status, which is a very cool um, observation and one that I think needs to be followed up further as we evolve the notion of functional connections and particularly functional connections um, across time. Um, let's move on to effective connectivity now. Um, um, I would say one of the first, and this is bragging, <laughs> one of the first um, examples of, of the application of techniques to measure effective connectivity in the brain was some work that I did a long time ago um, using what's called structural equation modeling, um, which is a causal modeling tool. Um, and the notion here is that you may have some nodes that you um, use some existing information to, in, to impart them with some directional connections. Um, in this case, we'll call it anatomy is a good thing to use as a prior, for instance, and we use that here. Um, and using the covariant structure of functional connections, you can decompose this covariant structure to derive weights or effective connectivity weights for the different connections. This can be done, um, you can represent it as structural equations, you represent that in matrix form as well, and get the um, derived or implied um, covariance matrix and compare the implied to the observed and then get to the point where they actually converge to some asymptote. And that gives you the estimation of the effective connections. Um, the paper we published on that uh, many years ago, uh, it's kind of, I don't want to say how long ago that is because I can't even calculate that number. It's a large number of how long ago it was. But this is based on some uh, very simple behavior studies in rats. I'm looking at acoustic startle and then using the anatomy of the rat um, auditory system to put in the arrows and then using the correlations of activity um, across rats in this particular case to give it uh, the arrows the weights to say how strong are the, are the effects coming from these particular um, uh, paths. And we found differences in terms of short-term versus long-term habituation. I won't go into the, the details here. Do you in fact get some, some group dependent changes in the um, effective connections? Uh, it can get quite complicated. This is some work I did with uh, the group at NIH, including Barry um, Horwitz, um, where we looked at a fairly large cortical model. There's, um, I think, uh, 11, uh, no, wait, 23 regions and about 140 connections that are estimated here simultaneously. Quite complicated. It took a while to do the, 
the modeling and interpretation. But from here, you got a fairly good um, uh, est, um, interpretation of what you see happening as a function of changes in working memory delay. Um, and this is across different instantiations. Um, this is within subject design, um, showing changes in the, the dominant effective connections um, as people move from a short to a long term, a long delay in the working memory task. Um, it's been applied in a number of patient studies. More recently, some work from Anna Slodkin, um, looking at uh, patients with um, spinal cerebellar ataxia and looking at the changes in the cerebellar cortical um, interactions um, as you go from presymptomatic people with SCA or SCA to more moderate and to severe situations. You find that with, with severity, the, the effective connections actually grow somewhat higher and then drop off. So they're suggesting that there is some either an attempt to maintain some pattern effective connections, or in fact, potentially that could be um, maybe catastrophic. It could actually be sort of a hyperexcitability thing happening. So this is an important feature um, of being able to use the patterns of network interactions to drive um, subsequent um, explorations of what may be happening at the sort of biophysical level. Um, Within the, the realm of, of neuroimaging, um, Carl and his crew um, introduced um, dynamic causal modeling several years ago um, as another technique to look at um, direct effective connectivity um, in the brain. Um, and this is a nice example of, uh, of an intersection between predictive models and generative models, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, um, in that you are assuming a sort of a, a a base model which generates a bold signal and you're, you're actually using the generative model to make the inferences so the parameters that are at the level of the generative model are the ones you're focusing on making the inferences about the interactions um, so the dynamics are actually modeled um, at, by this uh, factor z that's put through a forward solution to generate the observed um, bold data so this would be a sort of a forward model for um, like a balloon wind kessel generation um, so the aim of DCM is to estimate the parameters at the level of the neuronal um, interactions or the, or the generative model that, gen that generates the, the bold signals. Um, this is uh, an example of that in sort of, a, an, again, a, a, a cartoon where you have the interactions at the neuronal level that are happening um, within each of the neuronal uh, populations um, that generate a bold signal. And that's where the, um, the inferences are driven. So you do the fitting here using a Bayesian minimization technique. And then from there, you get the parameters for the, um, the neural states that are, that are used to drive the, the inferences that one makes in terms of the change in the neural state as a function of the connections uh, between um, the different parts uh, within the, the fact of the, of the model itself. Um, this has been used to make some very nice um, inferences about the about the brain. Um, it goes beyond just describing the data, it actually helps to, to provide some inferences. And this is some very early work from Andre Amicelli, um, who used um, data from Jim Haxby's group to get an idea of whether the category specificity uh, activity um, that you see in uh, human visual cortex is more consistent with the top down versus a bottom up uh, effect. And I won't go through the details, but what they found was in fact that it seemed that the category specificity was actually related to more of a top, a bottom up uh, change in effective connections as opposed to a top down, which is kind of a cool observation and does make you think about things like how category specificity may in fact evolve um, from in the brain. Um, there are more detailed uh, models, I'm not gonna go through them in any great detail here, um, that go from uh, fMRI to things like the um, EEG and MEG. Um, the, the model here is slightly different, is actually a more densely uh, described by a physical model. Um, and this is looking at, um, uh, I think this is, uh, what is it called? N2 effects in uh, oddball detection in, in, in um, EEG. Um, and the model there was one that was, was um, developed by, by Marta as well as by, um, by Rosalind Moran um, to look at trying to take the um, description of the, the sort of cell layers and express them um, as a series of compartments that would then be used as a neural mass approximation. Um, and this capacity of dynamic causal modeling is actually quite important because now you can take different mean field approximation, different neural masses to put this, put them into this inferential framework to be able to describe the um, potential causal influences 
um, that that are consistent with the particular data set you're looking at. And again, making the inferences at the bait at the level of the interactions between these um, biophysical entities. And I'll come back to this later on, which I think is quite an important aspect of how the notion of connectivity has arrived and being able to estimate something about connections and make some causal statements about um, what's happening in these data. Um, a slightly different approach to measuring effective connectivity is what's called Granger causality. It's a general term used here. Um, it was originally introduced actually in economics, I believe. Um, um, but it's really looking at time series uh, effects and whether um, the time series you see for a particular variable um, is related to the time series of another variable. So for example, there's a variation in the time series Y, but does it predict the variation in time series X? Um, it was um, applied to a lot of local field potential data. Um, Majid Kaminsky actually presented at one of the brain connectivity workshops in terms of his um, evolution of Granger causality to what's called the directed transfer function. Um, and it's been more um, exhaustively applied, if you will, um, by adoption by Rainer Goebel and Alad Robrook um, to uh, take the Granger causality uh, framework and put it into fMRI uh, time series estimation, for example. And so here you have um, um, an example in, in an fMRI where you've got a particular time series from a voxel um, X uh, at a particular point in time T. Um, you've got its, its previous um, history, so the time series of X prior to a particular point in time and how it predicts itself. So this is basically an autocorrelation function or how well X predicts its, its, its future. Um, you then have time series Y and its um, its uh, history prior to that particular point at time t, and how that predicts um, that the current version of, of x, and then you have what's called instantaneous uh, effects. So the traditional Granger formulation is whether or not um, the additional information you get from the history of y predicting x is greater than what x predicts by itself. And that's the difference in sort of Granger formulation. You get more information by having the history of y predicting x. And so in the fMRI framework, um, uh, you'll often hear Rainer and colleagues talk about um, Granger causes, which are basically the history affecting the current point in time, and also instantaneous causes, which are the um, direct correlations at a particular point in time. Because of the, the time lag in bold, this does make sense because you are missing some information because you're doing a convolution into, in terms of hemodynamics, but there's a way of characterizing history, predicting the future, versus simultaneous um, interactions. And you see these maps now um, in some of the pub publications that have used greater causality. This has gone a long way since these particular things have evolved, but at least gives you an idea that Granger causality is a slightly different variation than what you see in things like DCM. It does explicitly use time much more so than things like DCM did originally at least. So um, we have heard about these two um, uh, components. Um, the uh, discriminative or predictive framework is the one that we hear the most about um, uh, currently. The generative model we've heard a lot about today. Um, most of what happens in machine learning and classic statistics is in fact in the sort of discriminative and predictive framework. So what you're really trying to do there is just it derive data features that differentiate classes. Classes could be individuals across tasks, classes could be in different individuals across groups and so on and so forth. Um, the descriptive techniques or predictive techniques really can't tell you about mechanisms. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, you, even though you can combine different data sets, um, it, it's again, identifying optimal features that discriminate things. And it's really hard to make mechanistic um, statements um, using those data. You can infer that certainly, but it's not, it's not really, you're not really testing mechanisms per se, you're just inferring them from the data. The generative approach um, is trying to say, if I, if I think this is what's happening at this particular level of, of, of the system in the brain, for example, if I think it's, for example, a balance of excitation and inhibition, I can include that in my generative model and then generate those data and see if the, the, the data I generate are consistent with what I see empirically. And that's, that's a slightly different approach, but an important approach that you're actually testing hypotheses about how the data were generated. 
That's certainly true for the DCM approach. It's true for virtual brain, which we'll talk about in a second. There are other techniques. A lot of the neural network modeling techniques are basically generative. Then goes one that's uh, used by a colleague in Waterloo. Um, but to do the generative model, you really need to identify the key elements you want to focus on. So you can't throw everything in there and hope that you'll find um, what the magic bullet is. It requires you to make some selections and that's an important feature of the generative modeling approach. Um, one of the methods I would say is that a really good example of sort of the, the full Monty version, if you will, of the generative approach is in fact the virtual brain. Um, this is a method that um, was introduced, I, I think, initially in 2012 to the neuroscience community. Um, it had preceded that. Um, again, it was, a, it was a derivation from our brain connectivity meetings um, through a number of conversations with the broad uh, members of the community. Most of you who were on here actually probably talked to us about virtual brain at some point in time in the past. The nice thing about virtual brain is it does allow you to pull different data sets together. So you can, in fact, um, pull together the geometry um, of the brain using some surface estimations, like gray and white matter, things of that sort, do it in a parcellation. You then can derive the inferred structural connectivity. You can use the other uh, methods. For example, you can use um, track-based uh, methods, for example, in the mouse or on the monkey and um, get a, a directed connectivity matrix, but usually it's non-directed. Um, once you have that um, core for the the conduits, if you will, you can then impart dynamics using a number of neural field um, approximations. Everything from logical oscillatory models all the way to much more complicated multi-compartmental biophysical models. You can stimulate the model either directly on a node or um, mod model things like TDCS or TMS. Um, and then through forward solutions, generate the kinds of data you see empirically. Um, LFPs are generated sort of as a, as a default but you can generate also MEG, EEG, serotaxic EEG, and functional MRI, and use that um, as a fitting criteria for your empirical data. So the nice thing about the generative approach um, is you can have the model um, fit to individual data sets. DCM does that, um, and TVB um, does that as well. Um, you can download the, the, the code um, from, from the web. Um, these are the people who you can blame for the development of the technique. Um, we are happy to be blamed for doing that, but um, it's our fault, if you will. That's myself, Victor Yursa, who's out here, and Petra, who's hiding in the background somewhere. Um, there are some great examples, and um, I'm not going to go through the great de the, the details of these examples. Um, and they, um, uh, great detail, but I just wanted to point out that um, you can, for example, this is one of the first applications where you can merge data. That would be things like the person's um, uh, cortical surface. Um, you can uh, identify the, the different uh, triangulations to get sort of a mesh, identify regions of interest um, in an individual, um, identify the centers, identify the um, connections using, again, diffusion tensor imaging in an individual. And then generate um, data that you, um, from the local field potential, you can generate, of course, from forward solutions, EEG activity. Um, you can generate um, you can generate fMRI, which have a different time, uh, time scale um, than the EEG uh, data. You would see the EEG data working at the level of milliseconds here. Here we're looking at bold, and these are working also at milliseconds, but you see the evolution of the activity across regions of interest is much, much slower. Um, and then finally, of course, oops, finally, of course, you can generate, I don't have it here, um, the local field potentials themselves. And the important thing here is that the same biophysical models generating these different kinds of, of uh, simulated data, which can then be used to, to map to the individuals. So some papers we've published, uh, this one here from Scherner et al, um, actually used merged fMRI and EEG data to get a better idea of, of the biophysical parameters that vary to generate both kinds of data. Again, some very interesting ideas about the balance of excitation and inhibition um, in generating intrinsic activity in the brain. Um, the, probably the most uh, exciting example, I think, in the application of, of generative model two application is some work from Victor's group looking at epilepsy. Um, this is using a phenomenological model called the epileptor which just looks at the excitability of different parts of the brain and how that 
excitability it propagates to different parts of the brain. Um, and whether that propagation pattern can then be used to inform where is the likely focus for the epileptic seizure. Um, and here you have an, an indication where you've got um, a, a single patient with a simple seizure, a complex seizure, and um, a simulated seizure. And you see that the simulated seizure and the complex seizure are very close to one another, suggesting the model's working. And then you can use that to map out where in the brain are the different potential sites for the propagation of the seizure, and then use that again um, to inform where you want to intervene. And that's, in fact, at the, at the heart of a, a national clinical trial going on in France, looking at using the epileptor model um, to guide um, surgical interventions uh, in patients. So it's a great example, again, of going from the concept of connectivity, structural connectivity, functional connectivity, a generative model, and then being able to use that Con confluence of connectivity to then inform clinical decisions, which is a fantastic, I think, outcome of the 20 years that we've been doing this work um, in the brain connectivity group. So end um, with um, a paper that um, I guess one of, the, one of the, the founding members of brain connectivity talked about this notion of it, the elusive concept of brain connectivity. And um, you know, uh, one of the things that Barry had mentioned in the very last parts of that particular paper was until it's understood what definition of each of the um, measures of connectivity are in the underlying neural substrate, comparisons of functional effect of connectivity across studies may appear inconsistent and should be performed with great caution. So I think that that sensibility still exists today. We have a number of different ways of, of measuring functional connectivity, structural connectivity, and effect of connectivity. And my message to you today is really more to focus on um, being very clear on how you estimate those things um, in the papers, in your discussions, in your talks, one another, and then being mindful of how to integrate the different ideas of, of these techniques and using things like, for example, DCM and TBB to generate these models that allow you to better understand what are the, the, the um, features in the empirical data that are important to generate these different kinds of um, times of effects. So with that, I'll stop here and thank you all for your attention. I'm thanking a thousand collaborators and millions of grants that have supported these, this work um, over the uh, 20 years we've been doing this. It's been a fantastic journey. I'm looking forward to the next 20 years. And here at the bottom is the link to the, uh, to the slides that you're interested in looking at them later. Thank you.